Welcome. We're going to get started on this month's webinar. So, you so far nobody's here, but um, some of you may be watching this replay. And yeah, welcome. I've had the um, honor, the opportunity of teaching at the Canadian Tantra Festival this June. And I don't know if you, if you don't live in British Columbia, um, try to find a Tantra Festival near you. There's two in British Columbia. Um, one is in Squamish and the other one is near Calgary. And these weekends are such healing experiences and uh, really great information for anybody's relationship. So some of the things I'm going to share with you tonight are inspired by what I learned at this year's Tantra Festival. So you may be familiar with the love languages. Um, I was introduced to the love languages um, a while ago. Welcome. So I was introduced to the love languages uh, a while back, and as many people might have heard of, heard about it. Um, Let me just get this sorted here. So yeah, the five love languages, Gary Chapman. Somehow this book found its way into my hands. Um, but I think I heard about it before that um, from some friends. And so this is really cool. Um, if you haven't heard about the five love languages, um, they help you to understand how you equate love, like what actions that other people do towards you equate love to you. So human beings, we all need love to survive. If a baby is um, abandoned or not looked after um, and not given any love, it will have a really difficult chance uh, to survive. So I believe that, um, for example, a lot of trauma in really young infants and um, toddlers is created when the child believes or interprets that they are not loved by their caretaker. So this could be waking up and crying in your crib in the middle of the night and nobody came to get you. Like, you know, to a toddler, this is really traumatic. So love is really, really important. We need love to survive. But we all kind of have a different idea of what love is. So this is a really helpful tool for couples to figure out um, what their each partner's love language is and to learn how to give love, even if it's not the way that you naturally would give love, learn how to give love in the ways that your partner needs it. Otherwise, they won't feel loved. So we're not going to do the quiz together because I want to uh, focus on doing the quiz of um, the erotic blueprints together. But you can go ahead and do the quiz of the five love languages. I believe you just go onto the internet and you go to fivelovelanguages.com and there is a series of 20 questions. And by answering these questions, you will eventually arrive at some kind of conclusion as to what your um, dominant love language is. And you, when you do the questionnaire, 
you even put in whether you are single or whether you are in a couple and then depending on that they address the questions uh, differently to you to make it more personalized so basically for those of you who haven't learned about the five five love languages here they are so we've got words of affirmation physical touch receiving gifts quality time and acts of service so i like this little chart it's just a handy little chart how to communicate words of affirmation so anything where you're encouraging or being encouraged or affirming or appreciating using words to appreciate um, someone or if someone is actively listening to you so that's an important one that actually I didn't realize um, I have over the years I've met uh, several men who've kind of dawned on the reality that a lot of women just need to be listened to it's just we just need to be listened to like you don't have to fix our problems but and and many people if you just are present with them and listen to them actively um, it gives them a space to process with their words uh, to get things off their chest to share and if we don't actively um, uh, share um, what our truth is and what our true feelings are then we can get blockages around our throat chakra so that's something that I see as a medical intuitive quite often is a whole lifetime of a person's experience uh, not having um, been able to to really communicate their feelings maybe because they weren't um, they weren't encouraged or it wasn't welcome so this is encouraging affirming appreciative words so how to take action or actions to take um, send an unexpected note a text or a card where you could just tell the person or um, communicate in some way um, things to avoid um, not recognizing or appreciating effort so I don't know many of you may have had this similar experience I I've, I've heard it a lot and I mean I've experienced it a lot but oftentimes when we are employed as an employee we really love for our bosses or those that we're working for to recognize us and recognize and appreciate our efforts and this is something that probably a lot of people can relate to so another love language is physical touch so how to communicate physical touch um, non-verbal use of body language and touch to show love this could be giving someone a hug this could be touching someone's arm this could just be supporting a person by putting your hand on their back um, this could be um, you know snuggling as it says here hugs kisses cuddling any kind of physical touch and then the things to avoid are physical neglect or abuse so physical neglect is a huge issue oh my gosh I cannot tell you how many people I see as adults in relationships who experience physical neglect from their partners and it may also be that this person is um, lacking the sexual and intimate connection that they desire but what seems to happen from what I have notice from multiple people telling me is that their partner um, and a lot of the time it's men who express this um, physical neglect um, maybe their partner doesn't want to have sex as much anymore but what ends up happening is 
all of the physicality in the relationship stops. So there is no more cuddling. There is no more touching at all. There's no more anything. So anyway, I see this a lot in adults. And I certainly notice it when I, I, this is my primary love language right here. So I really notice this one. If I haven't had a hug for a couple of days, I really start to notice. And if I have a lot of people around me who are touching me, it makes me feel good. You know, cats, when they're together and you know, see birds and all kinds of species um, grooming each other. You may have seen videos of monkeys grooming each other. When we touch another person, snuggle, cuddle, it produces all of these um, these hormones. Oxytocin is a big one for touch, and that helps us to feel good. So, yes, this is one that I notice quite a bit. Receiving gifts. So some people equate feeling love to be receiving gifts. So how to communicate this through thoughtfulness, through making your spouse a priority. Huh, interesting. Okay, so that's not necessarily a gift, but um, making your spouse a priority is something interesting to think about. Um, actions to take. Give thoughtful gifts and gestures. Express gratitude when receiving gifts. Things to avoid. Um, unenthusiastic gift receiving. So if you're a type of person, this is not your love language and your partner who's, this is their love language, gives you a gift and you don't appreciate it. Um, you're basically saying, Meh, you know, your love is not really valuable or worthy or worthwhile to me. So that makes sense. Um, oh, and forgetting special occasions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so quality time. This is another big one for me. I would say physical touch and quality time are my top two love languages. So this is uninterrupted and focused conversations on one on one time is important. So if our friends or our family or our loved ones don't make the effort to spend time with us, if this is your primary love language, it could really feel like that person doesn't love you. So create special moments, take walks, and do small things with your partner. Um, and things to avoid, uh, distractions when spending time together, long time without one-on-one. -on -one. So this used to bother me a lot when I went out to restaurants. Uh, when I lived in Japan, it was becoming the cell phone age. I lived in Japan around the year 2000, before people here had cell phones. And sometimes I would see couples together in restaurants and one person would be on their phone while the other person was just sitting there doing nothing and staring into space. And because quality time is something that I really value and it's one of my love languages, I was shocked. I was like, I can't believe those two people are together and that person is not paying attention to that person. Um, so I think we probably all need to be more aware of this in the cell phone age now that his fully hit us. Um, yeah, just experienced this today at work with a, a young teenager was hanging out and we were talking to him and he wasn't even looking at us. That could be a teenage thing too. I don't know. But anyway, I think a lot of these socialization things um, happen when, uh, when we're teenagers. So, okay. Last love language, and then you can go and take the quiz yourself at fivelovelanguages.com to find out what you are, um, is acts of service. So this is a pretty big one for me too, so I really understand this. Um, 
This is when other people want to help, when you're letting others know that you want to help to lighten their load. So mothers really appreciate acts of service, but I imagine it's not every mother's primary love language, but just a little thing like doing dishes really, really helps. <laughs> So when you realize that this is one of your love languages and um, and you know and stuff like that really pisses you off when you're not getting help around your house, um, yeah, it makes sense. Why? Um, actions to take: make them breakfast or dinner. Go out of your way to help with chores. This was definitely an issue in. Um, one of my long-term relationships and I would be pulling my hair out going, why do I have to pick clothes up off the floor? Um, and yeah, but also um, I read a really good book that helped me to understand also how the female brain works and the male brain. And that was um, a book called When Mars and Venus Collide. And it was talking about how men and women um, are under stress and pressure, how they're different. So um, that helped make a lot of this stuff also make sense, but nevertheless, it is a love language. Um, lacking follow through on small and large tasks is something to avoid. Hmm. I've heard about that recently as well from people being uh, not happy that their partners are haven't finished something that they were going to start. So those are the five love languages. So moving on. So when I learned about the erotic blueprint um i thought to myself oh wow yeah this is definitely like love languages but it's for sexuality so um i've been enjoying watching a few videos and some podcasts with the originator um whose name is jaya and her website is missjaya.com and um all you have to do is look up your core erotic blueprint and you will um, be able to go online and do this quiz if you like but we're going to go through it here together so that we can really get into it and get into the questions and um, so what you're going to need is you're going to need a piece of paper and a pencil and or a pen and um, we'll need that in a few minutes, so you can take the next couple of minutes to go and find that. And we're going to write all of our answers down and I'll show you how we're gonna do that. So, the erotic blueprint. So we have five different core blueprints. Um, they are energetic, sensual, sexual, kinky, and shapeshifter. Okay, so a little bit about these blueprints. So the energetic blueprint is turned on by anticipation, by space and tease, and prefers light or hovering touch. So these people are very, very highly sensitive. Um, therefore, they're able to have orgasms without being touched. Usually more intuitive lovers who value sex as something more than just physical. So uh, activities that energetic lovers may really enjoy are things like eye gazing. That's a that's an activity that um, we often do in Tantra. And just by staring into each other's eyes and seeing the other person's soul, because we're, we can feel, we can feel that person's soul. We can 
detect that person's energy. So just gazing in their eyes and eye contact can be a really, really huge turn on for the energetic um, lover. I remember when I kind of entered the world of um, the LGBTQ world in Vancouver. So I realized at some point, or at least I admitted to myself, that I was bisexual. And I started going out to uh, women's events. And the first thing that I noticed about going to women's events was how much more eye contact there was um, with women. Like they would look at you from across the room and you would know that they were <laughs> looking at you. It was very, very much more energetic than going to like a regular bar where there was men and women. So I found that really interesting. Um, one of the shadows of the energetic blueprint is that their hypersensitivity may cause them to short circuit and turn off quickly. So they can get hierarchical and they may dissociate from their bodies because they're so sensitive. So I can also relate. I am uh, a shapeshifter and the shapeshifter is all of the um, all of these equally so I can relate to all of these um, this the erotic uh, the energetic erotic blueprint needs a uh, light hovering touch lots of anticipation so this is uh, about building a charge so they will be more um, sensitive to a charge, a polarity, um, the masculine, feminine, or the yin and yang polarity. So you wanna create tension. Um, this could be like something like you're, you're starting your foreplay like two days ahead of time with little flirting and things to get the person um, warmed up. And actually that really, really helps, um, really helps an energetic lover to get turned on if there's uh, lots of anticipation. Um, eye contact, breath, breath can be extremely sexy. Um, just having your noses close to each other and breathing in and out each other's breath. You're breathing in the other person's vital energy. Uh, teasing touch and energy games. So we'll learn more about this when we do the quiz. And then there's the sensual. So the sensual lover is turned on by all of their senses being engaged, ambiance, romance and sensory play so aesthetic they have an aesthetic for beauty and creation of sensual space so the orgasm could come from eating smelling touching their orgasm is multi sensory and sometimes uh, sensual people have a hard time getting out of their heads um, the orgasm may seem elusive almost there and then they're gone. They may worry a lot and project things that are not true. Also, if you're really um, in a, a sensual uh, lover, you may also um, not be able to have sex in like a place that's not comfortable to you. So for example, if there's a pile of laundry next to the bed or if the sheets aren't clean or if the floor isn't clean um you'll notice that you'll need to have like the exact right music playing to make love or the lighting will just have to be right you'll have to have glasses of water by the bed so these kinds of lovers because they're so also sensitive in their senses <laughs> have all these different kinds of um needs to be met. 
for them to feel sensual. Um, so the, the needs of the sensual person is peace of mind and addressing their fears. They shift, um, need to be able to shift from daily life to sexual life. So, um, you know, maybe need a massage or cuddling or just something to change the stimulation in their uh, senses. Um, they also need intense and different types of situation, uh, different types of sensations. So intense sensations can be um, uh, pain. So you could explore a little bit with things like scratching, biting, slapping, um, hair pulling, just different types of sensations. Or, or maybe you don't like the pain spectrum, but maybe you like more of like light touch, feather light touch. Um, um, a really fun uh, activity to do with a person who has a sensual erotic blueprint is to do blindfolds and uh, tease all of their senses. So you blindfold your partner and then you get things um, like musical instruments and you make sounds around them. You bring different smells up to their nose so they can smell it. You get a variety of different objects and, and touch their skin in different ways. Um, you have different food you feed to them. Um, yeah, this is something that we do at our, at our women's uh, tantra training. And it's really a lovely experience, very sensual experience. And then you have the sexual lover. This person is turned on by straightforward sex, nudity, orgasms, penetration, and genital, direct genital contact. So primary erogenous zones, the genitals, the breasts are sort of like the focus of this person. Um, so in the positive, they love sex, orgasms, genitals. They can go from zero to 60 very quickly, appreciate naked bodies and sexual visuals. This appears to be the cultural norm. Um, the shadow side is this uh, style or this type of lover can get too focused on the end goal and miss the journey. Genitals become the focus. They have a limited definition of what sex is. They may feel upset if orgasm doesn't happen. And then the needs of the sexual person, direct genital attention, erotic visual stimulus, orgasms, oral sex, and intercourse, nudity, and sexual frequency. So being uh, a person who is sensual and energetic as well as sexual, I can, I, can, I can honestly say that I've been in this situation before, maybe you have too, where a partner is too focused on the goal. I mean, I do need the sensuality and the energetic like to feel a connection to the person as well and then eventually I like the focus to be you know here as well but um, you know I guess when we're young and we're learning how to have sex you know we it's not exactly like we're teaching our teenagers how to be energetic and sensual lovers and so what are they going to do they're going to go for stuff that they have seen on porn. How else do they learn about sex? I feel like we need to take responsibility and teach our children, our teenagers, about sexual activity and relationships uh, more than we are. Otherwise, they will go through life maybe, you know, always being too focused and then you're not really being able to uh, satisfy their partners if their partners are more sensual and energetic. So that's the thing. We have to learn um, what our partner is, just like the love languages, to be able to communicate with them. 
and to help them and to serve them as well as our partner focusing on what our our erotic blueprint types are so then we have the kinky erotic blue type um, this style is turned on by power dynamics anything that feels taboo and is pushing the edges so um, this kind of lover can be very creative with a large sexual vocabulary they can use sex to get into altered states. When certain taboo or psychological buttons are pushed, they are turned on very easily. Um, the shadow side is that specific fetishes can become their only turn on. So you can imagine how uh, maybe monotonous that might be if you had a partner who was only kink and they needed um, this very specific thing to happen every single time otherwise they wouldn't get turned on but i mean if you're if you love that person and you're with that person then then you know i guess you would try um so they also may hide their desires and have deep shame because of the taboo around their fetishes um, without education, they may put themselves in danger. And what this person needs is safety, non-judgment, and permission. Uh, setting the context to hit psychological buttons, taboo, edge play, and proper education to sa safely navigate these. So, um, the power dynamics um, can be really, really uh, fun to play with if you're uh, if you have this erotic blueprint. And um, interestingly enough, this is a blueprint that I have grown into. I had to learn boundaries uh, for a large part of my adult life. And once my boundaries became stronger and more clear, and um, we do a lot of exercises in Tantra um, around saying no and learning what our boundaries are and learning that we don't have to be okay with things that we don't like. And we don't have to agree to being touched in ways that we don't want to or uh, activity that we're, we're not into. So that's learning your your boundaries so that's a huge huge uh thing for everybody to learn um so that you can direct you know things that you like and and have things that you like um so yeah so i noticed that once i became really good at saying no and knowing what i wanted then the power dynamics became more exciting because I can go to the edge of what I uh, like, maybe the edge of sensation or the edge of like feeling controlled. Even though I don't like in general life like to be controlled, I actually try to rebel against it. But somehow it turns out that um, in intimate situations, it's a turn on, but only until I found out what my, what my, could voice and and state my boundaries so you can um, you can be in different phases of all of these you can be um, you can be healing them you can be uh, exploring different ones you can be taking a break from different ones there's also this whole other dynamic in the five erotic blueprints about how you know you may have a few of these being your dominant ones um, and the other ones aren't but it doesn't mean that they never will be because you can change like you may be you know it's, it's all uh, it's all dynamic and so then finally there's the shapeshifter so the shapeshifter is turned on by everything above and they are sexually sophisticated and desire variety. Um, they're fluent in all the erotic types, never boring, extraordinary lovers. They love variety and creativity and are sexually sophisticated. They can become bored easily. So 
this is an interesting question that I asked um, my intuition or my higher self because because I've always kind of like meeting um, meeting people who were dissatisfied in their relationships, in particular uh, men expressing that their their partners didn't want to have sex with them anymore. And so I've always been like, hmm, why is that? Why? What's going on in these relationships? Um, one of the things that came through my intuition was that a lot of women get bored. <laughs> they have the same thing over and over again. They get bored. And it's interesting because I think in general, you know, females and, and people in general, uh, some of us desire uh, safety and security and someone we can trust and reliability, you know, all these types of things. Um, but um, I just heard of a book and I can't remember the title of it right now, but I will try to put it in the um, bottom of the replay video, which will be on YouTube. Um, the book that I'd like to uh, to refer you to it's um, a woman who's a counselor and a therapist and she noticed through her work that although you know a lot of women do seek that security and safety and dependability they that does not stimulate them and turn them on in the bedroom so people need a uh, variety so one of the shadows of the shapeshifter is they can become bored easily um, if there's not variety. Um, they're always shape-shifting to meet others' needs. Um, that will leave them unfulfilled and unable to develop their own sexuality. So they may feel misunderstood or unsatisfiable. Um, they need variety and creativity, finding a deeper core to explore. They need mixing blueprints in the right combinations to achieve high states of arousal. So you may already have an idea of what your blueprint is, but we're gonna do the quiz together. There's 17 questions. So on your paper, you're going to write the columns A, B, C, D, E, and then you're going to write one, two, three, four, five, seven, all the way down to 17. And then you can put these words under all of these columns. And then just these numbers, 1, 8, 9, 10, 17, and the total. So I'm going to go get a piece of paper that I forgot. And I will be right back while you are making your chart. Okay. So I mentioned that all of the erotic blueprint types, that, that you can be in different stages of them. And that's what I forgot. I forgot the paper I have with the different stages. So the stages that you can be in, in any one of these is uh, resting or healing. You can be healing one. So I think for me, maybe for a large part of my life, I was healing the kinky side of me. Um, and, and there's shame there around sexuality for me, which I've been healing as well. So I think as my boundaries got stronger and as I healed, uh, sexual shame, I opened up to the kinky side of me. You can be in a curious stage. You can be uh, in an adventurous stage. And you can be in a transformative stage, which is looking deeper. 
Okay. So let's do the quiz together. Question one. During foreplay, I prefer A, emotional connection and the anticipation of what is about to happen. B, a hot bath, massage, and slow kissing. C, psychological power plays, restraint, and dark fantasy. D, who needs foreplay? <laughs> e, all of the above equally. Number two, I am most turned on when A, my partner's arousal increases, the more aroused they get, they, the stronger my arousal. Okay, just we're just gonna back up one second because someone just arrived and I want this person to get the chart. Okay, so he just arrived. You need a pen and a piece of paper and you're going to need to make these columns A, B, C, D, E. 1 to 17, um, the total, and these five erotic blueprint types in the columns, and then the number 1, 8, 9, 10, 17. So you can go online and do this quiz. So you can come and look at all the questions if you like, and I'll just get everybody to, um, if you could, yeah, yeah, make sure you're muted so that we don't have any background noise. Okay, so we were only on question number two. I am most turned on when A, my partner's arousal increases. The more aroused they get, the stronger my arousal. B, I can get out of my head and relax more deeply into my body. I am most turned on when I can get out of my head and relax more deeply into my body. I, can, I am most turned on when I am doing or fantasizing about something considered taboo. Most turned on when my partner is naked and ready. I am most turned on when all of the above are happening. Okay, question number three. I have sex in order to A, experience something transcendent and connect emotionally. B, feel pleasure and connect more deeply to my body or my lover's body. I have sex in order to feel pleasure and connect more deeply to my body or my lover's body. I have sex in order to C, overcome shame, let go of responsibility or play. I have sex in order to D, have a release and feel more relaxed. I have sex in order to E, all of the above. Four, during most erotic encounters, I would consider myself A, extra sensory, B, romantic, C, out of the box, D, mostly visual. E, I am equally all of the above. So as we go through these, you may start to be able to see what is what. Extrasensory, any ideas what that is? That is the energetic blueprint. Romantic is the sensual blueprint. Out of the box is the kinky blueprint. A visual, if you remember, is the sexual blueprint. And then E, all of the above, is the shapeshifter. So we're starting to get an idea of what, uh, what these different blueprints like. So read the following scenarios and choose the one that is most arousing to you. So A. I can feel the energetic connection between my partner, partner and I. I know from the eye contact that they are right there with me. 
I feel electricity between us as our bodies get closer and closer together. When touch comes, it feels as though a jolt goes through me. I close my eyes and I sense my sexual energy expanding out as if I were making love to the divine. So it's a thing also about the energetic um, is uh, kind of like a being so sensitive that um, there's this kind of connection with the divine or this, this know, knowing or a feeling into this multidimensional aspect of being a human being. We're not just this physical body, but that we are beyond the body, that we are energetic beings, that we have spirit. So um, a lot of women uh, often who are energetic and their partners are not energetic, they have this like, oh, but there's more, like there's this whole spiritual connection thing that my partner doesn't uh, go into with me. And so that's why it's really good to do Tantra if you're in a partnership like that with, so that your partner can get an idea of, of different activities and things that you can do that uh, touch upon that sort of spiritual realm and that spiritual uh, sensitivity of your partner. Anyway, B, a soft fur mitt runs over my skin. I delight in the sensation and a soft moan escapes from my lips. Massage oil is applied to my skin and I am being deliciously and sensually stroked. Fingertips grazing over my genitals, teasing for a moment and moving on. I writhe as my whole body awakens to the erotic. So you can guess which one this is. This is the sensual one. And we learned that the shadow of the sensual lover is being too much in the head. So the sensual person really needs to come down into their physical body to be able to be present with all of their feelings and their sensations. Um, C, don't move, my lover commands. He or she holds my wrist to the bed and I feel their power. A hand goes around my neck as another goes to my nether regions. I'm exploring my property, my lover exclaims. I know I will be taken tonight and the play sends thrills through my whole body. So, yeah, interesting. I definitely have had lifetimes and lifetimes of trying to escape being the property of men. So, hey, I'm single. Maybe that has something to do with it. But um, actually now I'm really wanting that, especially in the bedroom. So interesting, interesting. Makes life so interesting. D, no foreplay needed. My partner is naked and ready for penetration. The sex is intense as we thrust passionately together. The orgasm is even more intense and highly pleasurable. We lay together, panting and satisfying, satisfied. And E, all of these are equally arousing. Okay, seven. When you fantasize, you have thoughts of something bigger than yourself, experiencing yourself far outside of your physical body, or you see vivid colors of focus on emotional connection. Just a thought causes orgasmic shivers. B, you imagine romantic scenarios where you're able to luxuriate in sensual play, such as slow dancing, eating, an amazing meal, being deeply in love and insatiably desired, having hot baths or long, slow erotic massages before sinking into highly pleasurable lovemaking. When you fantasize, you see, think about overpowering someone or being overpowered by someone, fantasizing about out-of-the-box sexual practices such as impact play, spanking, slapping, paddling, restraints such as handcuffs, ropes, spreader bars, or other kinky activities. When you fantasize, you D, picture penetration, group sex, or prefer to watch adult films. And E, you use all of the above in your fantasies. Eight, during sex, what do you find yourself thinking about the most? A, 
I sense more than I think. I sense emotions, my partner may be feeling, or things that are hard to explain. My mind thinks about all kinds of things. B, what I didn't finish at work, how my body looks, something distracting in the room, if I'm taking too long, etc. C, a specific fantasy. Maybe it's being so irresistible that my lover must take me. Maybe it's about being spanked, or maybe it's about being tied up. D, if I'm thinking, it's usually about my orgasm or my genitals or the hotness of my lover. E, I think about all of these in equal amounts. So you can see the questions are ordered <laughs> in the same way each time. What turns you off the most? A, direct genital touch given too soon or lack of a sense of connection. B, being stuck in your head, tension or distraction. C, lack of something naughty or overwhelmingly shame, guilt. D, too much complication. E, all of these turn me off equally. Sorry for the spelling mistakes. 10, what do you dislike the most about sex? A, it's too physically base. B, sexual fluids and the mess. C, feeling guilty or weird during or afterwards. D, when there isn't an orgasm or the orgasm is too quick. E, what's not to love? 11, what best describes you when things go wrong? A, I easily get overly sensitive and or feel misunderstood by my partner. B, I tend to feel worried, tense, and distracted. C, I feel shame about my desires and sometimes shut down my pleasure. D, I get focused on my performance and having or not having an orgasm. E, all of the above describes me. 12, what best describes orgasms you would like to have? A, Bigger than myself, cryotic, transcendent, mind-altering, spiritual. B, full body, extended, slow, deep, connected, simultaneous. C, powerful, taken or controlled by another, owned, out of control. D, just as long as I have one, any orgasm is great. That's the sexual person. Orgasm focused. E, all of the above are equally pleasing. When it comes to touch, question number 13. I prefer A, hovering over my skin. B, long, slow, sensual strokes. C, nibbles, scratches, and love taps. D, direct genital touch. E, all of the above are equal. 14, during sex, I most enjoy A, feeling a sense of oneness and connection to something greater than myself. B, igniting all of my senses into whole body orgasmic bliss. C, surrendering, being ravished, or taking control, power. D, penetrating or being penetrated. E, all of the above are equally enjoyable. Question 15, which sex do you most prefer? Visualizations and breath. B, fur, feathers, or a massager. C, restraints and impact toys, hands, paddles, crops, etc. D, vibrator, dildo, or genitals are good enough. E, all of these are equally pleasurable. Question 16, which sex technique do you think you would like to do the most? A, hand 
and heart eye gaze. So that's like holding hands, um, sitting across from each other and gazing into each other's eyes. Up. Sitting across from each other, hands on our hearts, breathing and gazing into each other's eyes, feeling our connection and oneness. As we breathe, we pulse our pelvic floor muscles to build more erotic energy and intensity between us. We use our intention to send love and lust to each other, and orgasmic pleasure moves up our spines. The anticipation builds as we envision the transcendent lovemaking that is about to come. So this is kind of like a classic sort of tantra exercise. Um, maybe that's why I love tantra so much. <laughs> Witnessing B, witnessing the sensory. After a delicious warm bath together where we took turns bathing each other with great smelling soaps, one of us is blindfolded and naked on the bed. The room is warm and the glow of candles flickers in the clean space. Hands slowly and luxuriously run over skin, then feathers, then fur, then tastes begin with delicious chocolates and succulent fruits. Kisses spread from chests to nether regions as moans escape lips. So what, which sex technique do you think you would like the most? C, playful restraint. We look into each other's eyes as the restraints are being placed on wrists. They are tightly pulled, feeling safe and secure. Ropes expertly expertly bind the restraints to our bedpost. Now the ankles, legs spread, secured and helpless. Now this restrained body is ready to be played with. Spread eagle, exposed and waiting to be taken. D, sex positions. I know the position that brings me the most pleasure and that gets me to orgasm. Sometimes it's good to mix it up. So a pillow is placed under the pelvis. We focus on genital to genital contact. Penetration never felt so good. E, all are equally enticing. Make your selection. And final question. When I took this quiz, I, A, felt anticipation. What else is possible for me in my sexual life? B, I thought hard about the answers. I don't want to answer these correctly. C, I got excited about being freer. I'm not so weird. D, I felt frustrated. Why does this all matter? Let's just do it. And E, all of the above. Okay, so now is the time to go and count each one. So, um, I'll show you the chart again. There's the chart for those of you who may have come late. Okay, A is energetic, B is sensitive, C is kinky. D is sexual, and E is shapeshifter. So you simply add up all of your answers in A, give your total, B, C, D, and E. And notice which column you have the most. You can have two that are equally your core, or you could have three that are equally your core. You can be a combination of all of these, um, but this will give you an idea of what your primaries are. And then also don't forget below, 
question number one, eight, nine, 10, and 17, and the total. And I'll show you what we are going to do with that in a second here. Okay, so what is your blueprint? Mostly A's, you are energetically wired. So people with an energetic core are highly sensitive. They live in the realm of emotions and energy. The more pleasure their partner feels, the more aroused they become. This is definitely true. I can definitely feel it when my partner is really aroused. Anticipation may often become, anticipation may often be more arousing than actual sexual touch. The positive aspects are highly sensitive, turned on by energy play, turned on by their partner's pleasure, easily orgasmic through a variety of routes. Again, the shadow aspect, they short circuit with direct genital touch. They're affected easily by negative emotions or thoughts. They're more interested in being out of their body. They may judge sexuality as not spiritual. Mm. They are fed by energetic play, anticipation, partner's arousal, transformational sex, meditation, yoga, expanding outside of their body. I would say Qigong. I, I practice Qigong, and Qigong is very, very energetic. Um, and Qigong Tao Tantra is also very energetic. So you learn to tune into your energetic body and be more sensitive, but also to heal um, the fear that can often um, be a shadow aspect of the energetic. Yes. So mostly bees, you are sensually wired. People with a sensual core often complain that they have a hard time getting out of their heads. They need to relax in order to have sex. They are highly sensual creatures affected by smell, sight, sound, touch, and taste. They tend to be interested in slowing down and being romantic. Positive aspects are they're highly sensual. They could swim in sensation for hours. This brings color to they. This brings color to sexual experiences. They love to give and receive sensual play. The shadow aspects are they get stuck in their heads. They can't be present. They judge themselves harshly. Um, they have body image issues. They tend to want perfection um, and find it hard to let go. And they are fed by sensation play. They uh, toggle activities that help them to relax, massage, bath, exercise, cleaning, um, and reminders of pleasure throughout their day. If you got mostly C's, you're kinky wired. They are most turned on by out of the box sexual encounters. They may have had shame about their kinky desires and not allowed themselves to indulge in sexual activities that seemed weird or different or out of the norm. So the positive aspects, they can be turned by psychological play only. They have rich sexual, rich fantasy life. They enjoy variety and creativity in sexual play. And ultimately they're about experiencing sexual freedom and extraordinary sexual experiences. Shadow aspects, they may have been shut down by shame or guilt that overrides their desire. They may confuse fantasy with what they really want to experience, and they usually judge themselves or have been judged by others. Kinky types may get stuck in a particular fantasy that becomes their only route to orgasm. They are fed by any sexual play that is outside of their personal norm or that fits into their specific fantasy. And if you got mostly Ds, you are sexually wired. Again, sexually wired people are most accepted in our culture. Men especially are expected to be sexual. The sexual types are easy to turn on and they are sexual stereotype. The opposite of a sensual type, sexual types have sex in order to relax. 
Hmm, interesting. Positive aspects. They're easily turned on by visual or touch stimulus. They can go from zero to orgasm fairly quickly. Techniques work well with them and they are very fun to play with in bed. The shadow aspect. They can be focused on the end goal, orgasm. They are usually outcome driven and miss the journey to orgasm. They are most likely to experience performance anxiety and sometimes oblivious and self-focused during sex. They are fed by visual stimulation, adult film, sex techniques, genital focus, experience in orgasm, sexual variety, nudity, erection, or wetness. And if you have mostly ease, you are a shapeshifter. The shapeshifters can play into all the realms with ease and joy. Some shapeshifters are naturally this way and others learn how to wire themselves to be able to play with anyone. Note, you can also be a combination of two or more of these. For example, if you have equal amounts of A and B, you are an energetic sensual. Or B and C, you are a sensual kinky. We usually have a primary and a secondary core wiring. Positive and shadow. Each type also has a positive and shadow. Make a note to see if you're living more in the positive or in the shadow of each type. Okay, so now down at the bottom, we had these um, extra numbers. So if you answered D, for number one, give yourself one point for sexual shadow. Question number seven, if you answered B, give yourself one point for sexual shadow. Questions eight to 10, give yourself one point for any letter A. Question 16, if you answered D, give yourself one point for sexual shadow. Now take a look at where you mostly answered in the shadow. While your blueprint may be for one type of wiring, you can at the, at the same time be living in the shadow of another type. This is only if you answer differently for your shadow than you did for your core wiring. So that's what those last, last three are. Hmm. I don't remember doing this part when we were at the Tantra Festival. But I have my answers here so I can have a look. So have a look at those and see um, which one you may be living in the shadow of. Okay. Okay, well, um, I hope you learned something about yourself. Um, I certainly did, and it still, you know, going through it again for the second time now gives me more um, food for thought and more things to think about and to ponder on around people's sexuality and, uh, and helping people with these kinds of things. So I hope that was informative and um, don't forget, you can also do this quiz if you want to share it with your partner. You can go online um, or you can bring them to the video that I'm going to be posting on YouTube, which I will send a link out for and they can go through it. And that way they can also learn about what their love language is if they've never done their love language. So you get, um, then you can pause the video and go to the love languages website and do that and then come back and do this or you can just go onto the websites with your partner and, and do them and learn more about each other, about how to love each other, about how to please each other and, um, yeah. So I will 
say, if anybody has any comments or questions or anything that you want to share about what your love languages are or what your core erotic blueprints are, please go ahead and share or ask questions. Okay, I guess the topic is fairly self-explanatory and there's no questions or comments. So yeah, have fun sharing this with your friends, uh, with your partner. And thanks for listening to my webinar. Um, you can see my websites uh, for healing. I focus on women's sexual healing. Um, and I help men too, but, uh, my websites are wildlywoman.com and intuneholistics.com where I do medical intuitive assessments, um, private mentoring, instruction, and coaching, um, specifically and especially around sexuality, but it can be just around life and health stuff. Um, I do energy healing. I can do that in person or remotely. Medical intuitive assessments as well I can do remotely. And um, yeah, join either of these websites and join the newsletter so you can uh, find out about retreats that I'm going to be doing for women, more coming in the future. And have yourself an amazing summer, an amazing day. And thank you for coming.